Okay, so it's about two after, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to our meeting where we're going to have four amazing hosts tell us about their sedation and um, pre sedation and anesthetic protocols prior to euthanasia. My name is Dr. Deborah Rotman, and I'm excited to be here. And a little bit about me, I've owned my own general practice, my own mobile euthanasia practice. I'm a partner at Beloved Pet Software, the pet crematory software. And I'm also a partner with Dr. Christy Cornelius with VetSpark Business Consulting for end of life care businesses. And I'm excited to be your moderator this evening. And so today we are going to start with Dr. Jeff Berkshire. And so Dr. Jeff Berkshire is joining us from Vancouver, Canada. He is the owner of Lifting Stars Pet Home Care and has been helping families in the greater Vancouver area with home euthanasia and palliative care services for the past eight years. There you go, Jeff. All yours. Okay, thank you so much, Deborah. And um, thanks for the opportunity to share some information from north of the border today. Um, so yes, I've been um, the owner operator of Lifting Stars for eight years, a uh, veterinarian for 18 years altogether. So um, I will share uh, a couple protocols with you today that I've seemed to be really happy with, but of course, always open to, uh, to learn new ideas. So I really look forward to hearing what the other speakers have to say as well. Um, today, I will go over two protocols um, one that I use for cats and small dogs that are around 14 pounds or under. And the second protocol is what I use for dogs that are kind of four, 14 pounds and up. Um, of course, for those of you that might not be aware, we don't have tealazol in Canada, as you might be wondering why that is not on my uh, sedation protocols right away. So we have to to learn to live with it is all, and, and I'm quite happy with how these uh, protocols are working for me uh, so far. Um, on the slide here, just a couple other introductions. That's my little doggies in the top right corner. Um, we've got to remember all those things that bring us joy in our life when, when we're um, dealing with so many sad things. And there is my very silly horse on the left. He loves a good shoulder scrub and guaranteed to, to get a smile out of him every time he scratch along the shoulder. Let's dive right in. Um, so the first sedation, I'll do protocol one, and that's what I use in cats and small dogs. So as you can see, there's three medications there. Um, I use a combination of alfaxalone at two milligrams per kilogram, and also butorphanol and midazolam. And I've just put the notes, basically animals that are up to about 10 pounds um, will each get 0.1 milliliters of each of the butorphanol and midazolam. If they're in the 10 to 14 pound range, I usually give a bit. For the first protocol, um, I will combine all three of those medications into a single syringe. And most times I'm using a 25 gauge needle. So as small, small as I can use, that seems to work well. Um, it is given as an intramuscular injection. Um, but of course, this can pinch. Um, the volumes of this medication when we're injecting can range from 0.6 milliliters for a smaller cat um, to as much as 1.6 milliliters if we have a, a larger cat or um, you know, a 14 pound dog. So there can be a pinch. And I, I think a, a key to the absolute success of this is talking to the owners, number one, my goal is to make this as peaceful as possible for you and your pet. Um, talking about the advantages of the sedation, that we have a faster and smoother sedation, but there's a pinch involved. And I'll really be careful taking some time to guide owners and how we're going to gently hold their pet for that one second, just so we can try and make it as smooth as we can, preparing them that there could be reactions. Um, but thankfully, I find if owners are very well prepared, not only for what might happen, how to properly hold their pet, um, is that generally the outcomes are really good that owners are holding them exactly like I want them to do, which minimizes um, any discomfort for the pet. And then we get to have the benefits of this faster and smoother sedation. In terms of timing, something I really like about this um, alfaxalone um, 
protocol is they get sleepy fast. In, in most times, this is two to three minutes um, after the sedation is given that they very peacefully get a little groggy, start relaxing until they're sleeping very peacefully. And I, I really like that a lot. Um, a few other advantages that I'll mention about the alfaxalone protocol. Um, well, as I mentioned, it's, it's very um, fast sedation, very smooth and peaceful for the pet. Um, although the injection may sting, as soon as the needle comes out, they tend to, you know, kitties shake their head or take a look around what just happened. And it's very peaceful after that. There doesn't seem to be any residual sting. Um, when the sedation takes effect, they're completely um, immobilized, very relaxed and immobilized. Uh, blood pressure seems to be well maintained and respiration is calmed yet smooth. Usually slows down a little bit, but I think it contributes to the pet looking very peaceful. Twitching or spastic movements of the body are very rare, but they can happen. In my experience, maybe two or three percent of the time, if that, and I'll talk about that with disadvantages. Um, and just to note that I've used this exact same protocol for rabbits as well, and it, it works very well for rabbits. Um, a few disadvantages of this proto protocol, of course, I've already mentioned there is a larger volume, perhaps compared to what you're used to seeing with teal is all for lots of our American friends. Um, so that can um, be more of a sting associated. Um, I'm always cautious with really emaciated and or very sick pets that the sedation could be almost instant. Um, and I like to make sure to make owners aware of that just so we're prepared. Sometimes it's too fast um, when having at least a few minutes for them to get sleepy is generally welcomed, I believe. Um, back to the twitching and my experience with this protocol, thankfully there's very rare to see twitching like we might experience with ketamine in our patients, but occasionally they can have a movement where, for lack of a better description, they can kind of stick their legs out a, a little bit and the head goes back. And honestly, it's not the nicest looking thing when it happens in rare times, but I'll just try and be, remain very calm, careful with my wording. It's like, oh, it looks like the, the sedation is really taking effect now. But sometimes that might involve I'm reaching over and repositioning that kitty so they look just a, a little more comfortable rather than with their head arched back. But usually when this happens, it's just for a couple seconds and a little gentle repositioning. We can make them look nice and comfy on their, their bed or blankets, whatever it may be. Um, now I'll move on to my second protocol. That's um, for uh, larger sized dogs. And we've got the three medications and doses right here, but ever so briefly. Um, Ace Promazine, um, I use a 25 meg per mil solution. And the dose that I use most often is going to be about half a milligram per kilogram. And I do have a range there, you know, a little bit less sometimes for those dogs that might be already uh, on their way or very sedated already, or a little bit higher for those that could be nervous, anxious, or maybe fractious. Um, same for butorphanol, but I've got the dose I use most oftenly with a, a more narrow range where I'll of course be using the higher end for as needed. And finally, the ketamine. And this is one that's been a, a bit of trial and error over the years, um, but the doses that I've mentioned, of course, I, I love the benefits of not only the sedation, aiding blood pressure, complementing the other medications, but I don't like the twitching. <laughs> I don't like occasional, the rigidity might, that might happen with the limbs and occasionally when those respiration rates start coming up and We've given the sedation and now the pet's breathing fast and it doesn't look so nice. Um, I found using this dose is that that is at a absolute minimum, um, but of course it can happen sometime. So just to focus in on a few more of my um, advantages, um, let me see. The timing for this uh, protocol is still relatively fast. I would say the majority of dogs when I um, use this protocol, we're looking at about five to eight minutes. So a few more minutes than the um, alfaxalone protocol, but still relatively quick. Um, because it's a lower volume compared to my other protocol, seems to be tolerated just a little bit better on those injections, but I think the ketamine sometimes can have a, a bit of a sting. Um, pets are very well immobilized and relaxed when the sedation has taken effect. Um, blood pressure um, seems to be excellent to help facilitate um, the intravenous injection. Um, 
as I mentioned with this dose, any twitching or movements of the body associated with the ketamine are minimal. Um, some disadvantages of this protocol, um, of course, there still can be a pinch with the injection. So making sure to, to um, educate, educate clients on restraint and expectations really helps. Um, I've mentioned about the ketamine. I'll also, for ketamine, I do dose that based on an ideal body weight. So if this happens to be one of those really overweight labs that just can't walk anymore, I'm going to, you know, try, try and choose that based on what they should be rather than maybe that extra 30 pounds they could be carrying. Um, and also, I do believe it's the ketamine that can cause, as I mentioned, the respiration rate. So even sometimes using this dose will give the injection and now that pet's just starting to breathe really fast. It doesn't necessarily look as peaceful as I would like. Um, thankfully, this tends to be transient. I'll let the owners know, and usually it's a minute later and that breathing will start to slow down. But, um, you know, I've had owners look at me and ask what's happening. And um, so I'll try and tell them hey, this is a side effect of the medication, but it also tells me the beneficial things are happening as well, that the pain relief and sedation are working. So I try and put a positive spin even when we are seeing some of those things that um, aren't quite so desirable. Thank you, Jeff. The other thing, let's just quickly mention this, that Gateway is our biz backer for this and our Thursday meeting this month for our February month meetings. So thank you, Gateway, for um, backing this and being our sponsor. Okay, so, and thank you, Jeff. That was wonderful. Yay, that was good. Okay, it was great to hear how we do, how you're doing things, so. Okay. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. Jeff, you said both those protocols were IM, right? That's correct. Thank you. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you. So our next person up is going to be Dr. Faith Banks. She graduated from OVC in 1996 and has been practicing veterinary medicine in Toronto ever since. While working as a general practitioner, she became interested in geriatric medicine and pain management for pets while caring for her own geriatric Bernese Mountain Dog Smudge. She then started Midtown Mobile Veterinary Hospice Services in 2012, and it has grown to a team of 24 people. Last year, she opened Faithful Pet Memorial, Toronto's first aquamation water-based cremation service for pets. She is amongst the first group of veterinarians to be named as a certified hospice and palliative care veterinarian. And she shares her home with her husband and three children, a lovable senior Bernese mountain dog named Maple and her puppyish Bernese mountain dog, Elsie. Welcome, Faith. Thank you. Um, thank you. So I am in Canada too, which means we don't have Tilazol. So same sort of thing that has just been mentioned. Um, but you know, I kind of feel like if you've never had it, it's very different than having it and having it taken away. It's like my, yeah. So um, it, it's not something that I miss um, because it's just always been this way. And that's how we've sort of dealt with it. Um, so I'm going to take a step back because I just had this idea before um, that instead of just starting right here, I'm gonna take a step back in sedation because my sedation protocol doesn't really just start here. In a perfect world, it would start with the owner at home and having them have um, medication at home that they can give. Of course, because we are a um, mobile service and we're not their regular veterinarian, very often these families are coming to us um, for the first time and we haven't uh, met them before, we haven't done a physical exam on their pet, we don't have the VCPR, and so we can't dispense medication. But in my perfect world, every veterinarian, when your pet, when that pet turns 10 years old, they should get a little bottle that says, you know, to be used in case of emergency or at the time of passing or, or euthanasia. And, you know, they just have this bottle of medication that they put aside and they have instructions on how to use it and they're given, they give it to their pet, whether a veterinarian is gonna to come to the home for euthanasia or whether or not they're gonna take the pet into the clinic. And uh, you know, having gabapentin on hand to me, that would be great. So that's the first step in my ideal sedation protocol. 
The second step is what we actually do. Um, and that is for dogs, we use Dormosedan, um, which is the blue oral um, uh, gel that is the horse sedative. Um, and so we use that, we, we started off when we originally started using it, we were using it just sort of picking and choosing, but we pretty much give it to every dog. Um, we've recently tried something new that didn't go very well, but I'm gonna mention it anyways. And that is there is a horse acepromazine gel that is um, licensed and there's an actual product called Cetylin in the UK. And um, it's a very concentrated formula. Um, and so we had a company just outside of Toronto formulate it for us in the same way. Um, and I had a couple of my doctors try it on cats that really did not like um, to be poked by a needle. And the problem is that, you know, anytime you squirt something in a cat's mouth, they are going to drip and salivate. And even if we mixed it with something that tasted really good, they still did that. And it's this like fluorescent yellow product. So in theory, it sounded amazing. I was super excited. I gave it to all my doctors and it was a bit of a bust. So just thought I would share that. Um, as far as our actual protocol, um, we use what Kathy refers to as a one-step anesthetic protocol. And um, I quote you all the time because I learned a lot of this from you. Um, we've changed very slightly how we are dosing pets. Um, um, so basically, you know, I find we don't really change our protocols too much. I have to say whether or not there is a, you know, no matter what the underlying disease is for that particular pet, I just find that this works well for us. Um, so for dogs, um, we're doing a um, sub lumbar injection. We're using IM. Uh, we're using small needles, but long needles for dogs. Um, for cats, we're using sort of the small, short 25 um, gauge, uh, 5 8 inch. But for dogs, um, we use a combination of ketamine, midazolam, acepromazine, and xylazine. When COVID-19 started, we were not able to get midazolam. And so we added in butorphanol. Um, my doctors really liked the butorphanol. And so we just kind of kept it on when we added midazolam back into our mix. Um, those are our dosages. And we basically put it onto a chart and make it really easy for us to find, you know, the weight of the pet and, um, and how much they get. We mix it all into a syringe and give it that way. Um, I find the Dormosedan makes a really big difference for dogs. Um, my dosages, just Jeff, as you were mentioning, I mean, I think my dosages are even higher as far as the amounts. So it's a, it's a pretty large volume that we are giving into the muscle. But in some pets, you know, if I think they're not going to stay still the whole time, I'll say to the owner, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna give this, I know I'm going to get some in if he makes a fuss and I can't get it all in no problem. We'll stop. We'll let it have its effect. Cause I know it will, it'll have a significant effect. And then I'll simply give the rest. So I always feel it's just in the way that we present how we're going to give it. You know, I never say I'm going to give a one injection and that's it. So, you know, I I'm sort of easy with how I explain things to people. Um, and I think that that makes a difference for them. Um, for cats, we do intramuscular injections as well. Um, again, it is the anesthetic protocol because we typically give um, intrarenal injections for cats. And so we want them anesthetized. Um, and so again, it's a combination of the drugs above minus the xylazine, um, which would make them vomit. So um, it's a different dosing um, schedule, but uh, basically the same types of drugs that are given. Um, advantages of both. I mean, we've been basically using them for, um, 10 years now with very minor tweaks. Um, for my doctors, we find that this works. Some of them have changed it just a little bit here and there, maybe add a little bit more of this drug, a little bit less of this drug, but I just had everybody send me, you know, what, what dosing schedules are you actually using or, or protocols? And they're all quite similar, which they should be since we're all in the same company. Um, but I find that the time of onset, 
for the drugs to take effect is very quick. Um, within a minute or two, you know, the pets are getting relaxed. Um, they're getting very deeply relaxed, but it's a smooth relaxation. It's not sort of standing one moment and dropping down the next. It's just kind of gently lowering their head, um, you know, or snoring, and then, you know, they get deeper. So, so I really like how, how it affects them. Um, I don't love the poke of a needle and I don't love the poke of ketamine, but I find with distractions or, you know, scratching the dog's head or tapping their head or even tapping at the side um, where we're about to give the injection, typically we can distract them enough that they don't make a fuss. Um, disadvantages, I think, I guess the only disadvantage I can think of right now is that I would love it to be a more concentrated solution and therefore less volume, um, which is what you have with telazole when you mix it with ACE promazine. We don't have that. So, okay, good. Well, thank you so much, Faith. That was, You're welcome. and um, that was good information to have. Um, so let's see, is there anyone that has an immediate question for Faith right now that wants to just speak out? Anything? Okay. All right, it's quiet right now. Of course now. I do. <laughs> I couldn't what get that. Of course I do. Oh, of course she does. Okay. Hey, I was just wondering how long after um, you give every dog the dormicidin gel, and yeah. how long after you give it, you're using the oral buccal mucosal. I'm guessing. How long do you wait before you give the injection? So we usually tell people it's about seven to ten minutes, and you know, if you just guessed at how long that is, you would be way off. And so I tell people, I'm going to just look at my watch so I can actually, you know, know exactly how long it's been because a minute seems like 20. Um, and so I just have a look at my watch and, you know, see how long it's been. But I, I typically find seven to 10 minutes if the pet is not being overly stimulated um, and it's a quiet environment. Then, then all those things work to our advantage. Um, when COVID, um, you know, started and we were doing appointments outside, I found it was way too stimulating. You know, the neighbor was doing renovations and the birds are chirping and the dogs weren't relaxing. Um, or sometimes we have some owners that are just really rough with their pets and like as they're getting sleepier, the owner is trying to rouse them a little bit more. Um, but Again, if it's kind of a nice, quiet environment, seven to 10 minutes is what we usually do. So I always tell people they can be roused. It, it's like they're sleeping. If I came up behind you and scared you, you would wake up and they can do the same with the Dormos. I watched a video and I'm pretty darn sure they said Dormosidan. I used to call it Dormosidan and then I changed the way I said it. So now I'm confused because I don't know which one is right. Anyways, I still say they, they can still be roused. Um, and, and I see that, you know, they look like they're totally sleeping and you walk over and they like lift their head up and look at you. Um, so it, it's only one part of it. And I don't trust them to be out. I just trust that they are relaxed enough for me to gently do what I need to do to give the next injection. But I, I wouldn't trust an aggressive dog just from the gel, but yeah. I would trust a hundred milligrams per kilogram of gabapentin or more, plus an entire tube of the gel, right? <laughs> right. Which that's what we do for aggressive dogs. 100 milligrams per kilogram of gabapentin. Is that what you said? That's what we do. And then if, if an hour and a half before they're still wandering around, um, then I tell them to give like an extra 50 milligrams per kilogram. So I always do a lot more and then a full tube when we get there without the doctor being in the house. So the owner gives the tube. Wonderful. That's helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Good. Okay. So um, thank you, Dr. Faith. We are going to have our next presenter is Dr. Juliana Lyles. Like many veterinarians, Dr. Juliana knew she wanted to be an animal doctor from the time she was very young. She got her vet degree from Mississippi State University in 2009, where she met her husband, William. And over the years, their family grew to include their two children, as well as two cats and a ferret. 
Before realizing she had found her calling in end-of-life care, Dr. Juliana tried several different fields. In addition to working in small animal general practice, she worked at an exotics-only practice, worked on racehorses, and also at Lincoln Park Zoo and Shedd Aquarium in Chicago. In April 2012, she founded a veterinary hospice business called Lap of Love Veterinary Hospice of Chicagoland. In late 2019, she sold the company to Lap of Love Corporate and continued with their doctor and office team as a gentle goodbye veterinary hospice. The practice has grown over the years, and in addition to home hospice and euthanasia, they now offer telehealth quality of life discussions, as well as their own aqua cremation service. All right, welcome, Dr. Juliana. Thank you. Hi, like Dr. Deborah said, I'm Juliana Lyles, and I have um, some really extensive notes that I give to all of my new doctors when they're starting. And so I literally printed that out that has all of kind of the description of things. And I was just going to read that. Um, I think it kind of says it all. And, but I have, so I've used this protocol since about 2011. Um, I tweaked it a lot at the beginning and then it's, it's been working really well since that time frame. And so I haven't done much in the last probably six years or so. Um, I really like that it. It works really well, no matter what the disease process is, um, works for dogs, cats, small, big, um, low blood pressure, seizures, you know, whatever. Um, and the, I would say, as you can see, if you're kind of looking things out, that the the only dis disadvantage that I can think of is it's a giant volume. I'm kind of laughing to myself here and you guys talk about how it's a big volume and like, oh, <laughs> hold my beer, look at this, because it's it's a lot. I'm also drooling over Faith and Jeff and your 25 meg per mil ace, because that is, I tried so hard to get that here and I, I couldn't find it and I wish I could use it. Um, but so just like it's on there. So I have the, you know, teal is all 100 meg per mil. Um, I also wanted to point out, I haven't seen any difference using the generic, you know, teletamine zolazepam compared to name brand teal is all. Um, so I just get whatever is you know, cheapest when I'm ordering it. Um, so then the 10 mg per mil ACE promazine, and then mostly the 0 0.54 mg per mil atropine. There is a 15 mg per mil version that feels like it's just always on back order. And so I, I really can't find it very often, but I really like that one too. Um, then the 8.4% sodium bicarb. So I use 0.1 mil of telazole for 10 pounds of body weight. And then I have this chart for ACE. Um, if there's any reason to go up, like if it's a fractious animal or something like that, the ACE is what I'll bump up and I'll, I'll keep the other things pretty, you know, how they are. Um, like for example, on like maybe a 45 pound dog, I would use five mils of ACE. Um, and then if I'm using the 0.54 mg per mil atropine, I use the same volume of ACE minus about 0.5 mils, one to point, 0.5 to one. So like if I'm giving five mils of ACE, I'll give, like four to five mils of atropine. Um, so the goal of the atropine in, in this protocol is smooth induction, but also just keeping blood pressure up, decreasing secretions like drooling and things like that. Um, and so if it's a bigger dog and there isn't a history of like lying in one spot for you know three days where I think the blood pressure will be super, super low, then I might use a little less atropine, like a 90 pound dog would get maybe five or 5.5 .5 mils of atropine, um, just to make it a smaller volume that I give them. And then I use the same volume of bicarb as the volume of telazole, but I mix those first three together ahead of the appointment. So I have a syringe with the telazole plus ACE promazine plus atropine. And then in a separate syringe, I have the bicarb. And so I add the bicarb to the syringe right before I give it to the pet. And I think the family really appreciates that you know, I'm doing something so it doesn't sting more than if I would have just used something that didn't sting in the first place. I think they, it seems like they just really appreciate that, you know, oh, we're going this extra step. Um, the bicarb though, it bubbles up when you add it to the syringe. And so you have to pull back on your plunger and leave, you know, a little chunk of air at the top so it doesn't bubble out and, and get out of the syringe. Um, and then you can't like tip it upside down and back like that. You kind of have to keep it in a certain way until you actually get ready to give it to them. 
Um, and I use the lumbar apaxial muscles. I give it IM. Um, I wanted to also point out this product that we use, which is amazing. It is called a shot blocker and it's a human product, but basically it, it kind of overstimulates the nerve. So like if you were to give it right here, you, you give the, the injection right here and it kind of doesn't notice, you know, one more poke. These are just like plastic pokey things. Um, and it, it's amazing. Um, the only problem with that is when there's a really thick coated dog, like a Husky, a German Shepherd, um, I feel I'm not getting down to the skin like I would like to, but um, I actually, I can attest to it working because I use it when I get my vaccines too. I mean, it, it genuinely makes a difference and I can tell. Um, and again, I think just people appreciate the, you know, the effort of you trying to kind of minimize the discomfort. And we do the same, you know, distract them with Chewu or the pill pockets or something else, um, you know, while doing that as well. And we use a pretty small needle, um, depending, you know, probably 25, maybe 23 gauge if it's a bigger dog. And it's a big volume. And so, it, you know, as I'm giving it, I mean, it's a good two seconds, three seconds of injecting. And it's amazing that they don't seem to notice the volume. It's the, if they're going to react at all, it's that first stick. And so they don't usually between the shot blocker and all the stuff, they don't usually notice that. Um, but same thing that, that you do faith that sometimes if they're just kind of bitey or they're just really painful and I think I'm not gonna get all of it into them, I'll just prepare them. Okay, even if I'm not able to get it all in, we'll give a little tiny bit. Even if I get just a little bit in there, there's so much less painful too, where you, know, you just touch their skin and they flinch. And then that for, you know, this combo, the, the pain control part of the teal is always what they feel first. And so when, you know, three minutes later, you can tell they're significantly less painful and you can give the rest of it. And I like to point that out to the family too, of, oh, remember how she hurt so much? Now look, uh, you know, way easier. And the, what else I want to say about it? Oh, and if I ever do have to redose which is really, really rare, but sometimes they're just amped up. Like you're saying, they're outside getting stimulated or they have grossly misunder, you know, underestimated the weight. Um, then I'll redose with just the same volume atropine and, and ACE that I used before and not redo the telazole and the bicarb. Um, but I don't, I don't get, you know, a whole lot of reactions, anything like that. Um, it seems like it's a pretty smooth way of doing it. We also do the intrarenal for the cats. Um, and again, you can kind of bump up the atropine if you need better blood pressure, but mostly even just, you know, these amounts are enough to have good blood pressure, even on those pale, you know, you know, all of their blood is shunted to a cancer or something like that. It seems like it kind of keeps things up, you know, enough that you can still get an IV catheter in, in a dog. I want to take, we tell people that it can take up to about 10 minutes. I'd say it's, it's a pretty like six to eight, maybe 10 is usually kind of how it is. So it's a little slower than your guys are, but um, seems like it's a smooth process of getting sleepy. Thank you, Juliana. So does anyone have any questions for her in the current time? Otherwise we can have more questions at the end. What is the size of syringe you generally do? Do you use, get a 12 cc or a 60 cc syringe? What's your norm? Yeah, a 12 is probably like a 30, 40 pound dog. I mean, I have 25 mil ones that you know, I'll use sometimes. I do have some of that, that more concentrated atropine. And so I try and use that for the ones where I'm giving them nine mils of atropine, you know, instead it's 0.3, but yeah, they, it can be a lot sometimes. And then I always make a little joke with the family about how I used to do equine medicine and, you know, you jump in, you give it fast and this is the total opposite. We're giving it slowly. And oh, look, you see, he doesn't mind. And because meanwhile, as we're talking, I'm still ejecting. <laughs> 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 so What's your time to sedation after that? What was that, Lori? What's the usual time to sedation? I, I would say like six to eight minutes usually, sometimes more. And there are some where it's significantly faster, but I would say it's usually in that like six-ish minutes. Last but not least, we have the amazing Dr. Kathleen Cooney. And I would like to say something as she um, goes to her slide here that, um, and I'm going to read her bio in a moment, but I personally having done 
in-home euthanasia for a mobile practice for a lot of years. And then I went and took her um, CADA course or companion animal euthanasia training online course for 10 hours. And then I went and to her Colorado and did the live um, lab. And I have to say, I would recommend every single person who does mobile euthanasia take the course because you'll learn something that maybe you haven't learned before. And it's so hard to find a continuing education where you're like, wow, this would impact every single appointment. So super, it was super helpful. There are some really good things. Some are just good reminders, but I just, I can't recommend that enough. So I'm just saying that. So now I'm going to read, and that was not a paid endorsement. <laughs> so here we go. So um, Dr. Kathleen Cooney has been practicing advanced end-of-life care since 2006. She is CEO and Director of Education for the Companion Animal Euthanasia Training Academy, CADA, and Chief Medical Officer of Caring Pathways, Incorporated. She is well known for her work in companion animal euthanasia and is an author and international speaker on the subject. Dr. Cooney is a strong advocate for best practices in all aspects of end-of-life care and loves all things old and gray. Welcome, Dr. Kathleen. Thanks, Deb. I think this is the room that could also say that they love all things old and gray, right? That's why we do what we do. It's just the, the cherry on top of our work. So these are my protocols. And probably the best thing to do for a good use of our time is just you know, take a screenshot of it so you've got it. Most everything that I put out there in any of the CADA talks that I do for the IHPC, independent with CADA and other groups, pretty much has these same protocols. And the only maybe one or two things that I would pinpoint on this that hasn't already been said maybe by our other presenters tonight is that I used to use xylazine all the time, switched to dexmedetomidine and never looked back. I just, I love it. And it's just, it's more potent than the xylazine. And I did a blinded study for a while with dexmedetomidine and xylazine. They relaxed about the same amount of time or, you know, the same time to, to that deep relaxation. But the, once they were in that sleep, they stayed in that sleep and they weren't as likely to kind of want to revive a little bit or come out of it. You will notice that the canines here, we've got sedation protocol and an anesthesia protocol. One of the things I generally kind of teach is that if it's got an anesthetic drug in it, it's an anesthesia protocol. So if it's got teletamine, alfaxalone, or ketamine, it's technically anesthesia because we're trying to get them into full-on consciousness. So that if we do need to do an intra-organ injection, we can do that, right? They're deep enough for it. So the, the canine, I do have a sedation protocol in there because that's the one I reach for the most when I'm just going to do an intravenous injection. If I'm thinking I might need to do an intra-organ, I'll go with that full anesthetic protocol. And then for my kitty cats, I only do intrarenal injections or intrahepatic unless they're morbidly obese and I have to go for a vein or something like that. Uh, I will I will otherwise go for an intraorgan. So both of my protocols are anesthesia ones. And I'm with Jeff. I, I love Alfaxalone. In fact, I should get back to using it more. Um, I think it's a fabulous drug. And Jeff, if I get time for a question, I'd be asking you, I want a little bit more information on how well the dogs do with it. So with regards to how best to use just a couple more minutes of my time on this, I wanna point out a few things that we've learned out there from pet owners with regards to, to sedation and what they're expecting. And just so you all know, in a study that we published in DVM 360 last summer, it showed that owners are more than content if animals take up to 20 minutes for relaxation. If it's smooth and if it's controlled, then it doesn't feel like we're watching a, a pot of water boil. So as long as it's a comfortable time frame, it can take up to 20 minutes and that did not seem to annoy anybody at all. Uh, but three to 10 minutes was more typical. That's what they that's what they kind of expected, but they weren't too worried about that longer time frame. What scared them the most was seizures. So if seizures were gonna come about from any of these protocols, they were, they were most worried about that followed right underneath by pain. And for most people, seizures look painful. So obviously they wanna avoid pain at all costs. CADA has our euthanasia review department where we actually have pet owners reach out to us that have maybe had a dysthanasia, something didn't go right and they just wanna understand what happened. Most of them, probably 90% of them happen to do with pre-euthanasia sedation or anesthesia time. So, and it's usually because of pain. So we should be doing everything we can to avoid that. 
And as Faith kind of alluded to before, this idea of a, like most of what we've shown here is, are these one-step protocols. But if we're really, really worried about that pain, we should be doing a two-step protocol and getting something on board first, like the tomidine gel or the uh, just a injection of ibuprofenol and ACE or other, other oral meds that we can be doing ahead of time. CADA has a whole blog. I know this is an IHPC talk, so forgive me for talking about some CADA stuff. But uh, CADA has a blog on our website and I've got all my oral uh, drugs in there so you can take a look at it. And I love the chill protocol. I kind of like call chill protocol on steroids, like way up and then adding in that detomidine gel for dogs. So, so we should be leveraging those more and more. And if we have aggressive animals, if there's an opportunity to form a BCPR ahead of time, if that's required in your state or your province, that that we go ahead and establish a VCPR in some way so that we can get those drugs to those owners to give ahead of time. And in my case, a lot of the times now they're coming to my comfort center in Colorado, by the time the aggressive dog arrives, they're sound asleep. And that's what I want. So we're actually carrying them into my, into my uh, building. And Shannon Skabakis, I think it was you that brought up the aggressive dog that bit you on to Tomadine gel. I had a similar situation and I'll probably end with this story because I could go on forever, but I had a, a similar situation where a dog came in on the chill protocol plus detomidine gel. And I made the mistake of trusting that that dog was out as much as I thought it was. So we carried it in and laid it down on the ground in my comfort center and the dog turned around and bit the owner. And so I wish it would have bit me, but it bit the owner. And if I could go back in time, I would not have trusted that. I would have gone ahead and give my anesthetic protocol in the car, allow the dog to relax into deeper sleep and then, and then bring it in. So just a little bit of lesson learned there. Oh, and I, I do have to end with one thing. Because owners are so worried about pain on injection, they're worried how things are gonna go. It's one of the reasons that I now record all euthanasias. And so that if an owner says that, and I audio record them all. So if an owner says that their dog screamed out or their cat screamed out, it's actually on audio. Um, and so if the animal didn't do that and everything was very calm and controlled, I have that, I have that captured for, for reviewing back later if need be. So let's move um, on. Wait, I need to hear more about that. Yeah, the recording? Yeah. Juliana, yeah. I'm glad you're on here because Juliana and I were talking about this the other day. So you guys can all see my screen here. Maybe. Yep. Uh, okay. I've got a little app right there that says voice record and I voice record on my, and I voice record right on my phone. I'm sorry, this is not going to show up well, but it's just, uh, I just hit start. I have my phone silenced. I hit start. You can do this on a tablet. I just slip this into my doctor bag and it records the appointment from beginning to end. I upload it into Google drive. I save it for a year. And if nothing comes of it, then I just delete it and clear it out. And on my intake form, it says that I record all appointments for quality and assurance purposes. And that's all there is to it. Hmm. Do you record your hospice appointments or are you just recording um, the euthanasia appointments? I'm just recording euthanasia, although I do see a lot of merit to recording the hospice, because if you do need to go back, listen to something, what was said, um, it's all important. In fact, just today for a euthanasia appointment that I had, this owner was going through a lot of details about what she wanted to go with the animal, what she was going to take home and, and what she wanted back after cremation. And I could sit down there and write it all, which I certainly did, but I also had it on recording in case I needed to go back and, and reflect. Absolutely. Okay, everyone, anyone has questions, please feel free to just go ahead and chime in or you can type it in the chat if you don't want to speak out loud. That's fine too. And I will find that because it's not showing it right now. Dr. Cuny, I've been using your protocol ever since I started or took the your class. And the only thing, the only thing I have changed is that I now carry about a 10 ml syringe of saline. Mm. And I give the saline first and then I just unscrew the syringe and put the um telazole ace butorphanol mix right in the middle of that egg of saline. And I have not had a peep out of a dog or a cat since. And I now do use that with pretty much any drug that might sting. And it's been, it's been awesome. So, but I love your protocol. I, I don't use anything but it. Um, I'm glad you bring that up 
uh, because this is just the drugs and, and a lot of the other um, speakers went through some of the ways that they keep the pinch down, Jeff, cool word. I usually use heat. So I'm going to remember that pinch. And, uh, but yeah, really good tips and tricks in there. I also put in saline into anything that's got teletamine, ketamine, or alfaxel, and not so much. That's a neutral pH, but otherwise I am adding in saline just to dilute. So thank you for that. That's a good reminder. And so you actually do it in a bubble between. So you do saline, then the drug, then some more saline. Is that right, Caroline? Or no? No, I just take a 10 ml syringe and it just doesn't seem to matter even if I have a big dog, as long as I make that egg and make sure that my needle is still in the middle of that egg. Because sometimes oh. I'll just go ahead and eject it and then I pull out just a little bit with my needle and unscrew it and put the that telazole mix right in the middle of that saline. Okay, so you're making and, a few thing where you're holding onto the needle and then you're yeah, and I just unscrew it. You know, I've put the 10 mLs in and just unscrew it, put the say that put the telazole in. I can tell it's telazole because it's nice and yellow from the haze and just gently start pushing it in. And if I don't get a peep out of them, I know it can gently slowly push the rest of it in. And I did that because I had a couple of young animals. And even if I was having to, and I had to resedate, and even with the resedation, they were, or additional sedation, they were still screaming. I was like, a timeout, I got to figure something out. So um, that has worked really nicely for me, just trying to nail the middle part of that egg of saline. Are you doing IM or sub-Q for that? I do, I do uh, sub-Q and then I just sit there, oh. massage it in, and it seems to take about five to eight minutes for the most part, I just kind of massage that saline in. And it's been a real godsend for me because I just don't have any anything that like what I used to have. It's, it's really an interesting idea, Caroline, because I've been working with Mepivacaine, trying to pull away sting. Mm -hmm. And maybe, mix, maybe doing what you're doing could be an interesting angle. Uh, because we've been just, I've been just trying to mix it into the syringe in the hopes that it kind of dilutes it out because it, it's a neutral, it's a neutral um, local anesthetic. And so just trying to have that be the diluent so far hasn't been working. So perhaps doing this little preload with saline and mepivacaine or just mepivacaine and then bolusing in the drugs might work. But yeah, I don't, I've chosen not to do anything with a different pH because that can affect how rapidly my onset of medication can be. So I've chosen saline intentionally, although there was a period of time I was thinking, well, maybe if I give, you know, an injection of lidocaine or whatever, but this, just the saline has worked really nicely. I, I can speak from experience. I had a bupivacaine lidocaine uh, combo injected in, into me. It's painful. It is so painful. And you're it's just painful. like, oh, like I wanted to buy so, so I could see that that might be, so here's one more time, you're making a sub Q bleb and then you're changing the needle and putting in the TTA and then, and, then and sometimes I'll even take that needle and kind of go in and out a little bit along the track so that I have a nice big column of saline. So, so that wherever I end up and I use pretty much uniformly a 23 gauge needle. Okay. And one inch, 23 gauge needle, and just make sure that I have plenty of saline so that when I put in, I, and I'll know within seconds if I have slightly missed my bleb of my, my hen egg of, you know, saline. And so it's just, I just take the syringe off that's empty and put the new one on and inject and it's worked really nicely. And I guess I kind of got it out of human medicine when we use ultrasound to, you know, put, you know, lidocaine or whatever it might be around a nerve. It's like, oh, I can do this. I don't need ultrasound. I can do this. I can feel it. So you're keeping the needle in. You're yes. not actually removing the needle. You're the keeping only the needle time in, screwing and putting your new syringe on. Yeah. The only time I've ever had a problem is in a dog that might have four inch hair and I'm trying to make sure that I can get down there and not lose my needle. So another IHPC member taught us something similar many years ago at a, at a euthanasia technique workshop where she was using a needle and extension set, a short extension set, mm -hmm. and was just kind of leaving that in and just screwing that on the syringe as she went from saline to drug back to saline um, is what she did. So yeah, that was probably to push the saline through the, the line. Yeah. Put your drug through the line. Yeah. Um, I use 
I use a lot of ACE and I, I use telazole torb ACE with my protocols. And um, I had noticed, I don't know, several years ago that the big dogs didn't care as much for the, the telazole, they weren't reacting. And so I was like, well, I use a lot of ACE maybe, you know, cause I reconstitute my telazole with torb. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started increasing the ACE for my cat patients. And I was doing a lot of, sub, I still do a lot of sub Q, although I'm trying to do, I am with cats, um, just cause they tend to freak out. But I, I started, I noticed a significant decrease if none at all to cats reacting to me giving a sub Q injection. And if they react, it's towards the end of the injection, but it's very rare. And it, and it was a significant difference when I upped my ACE. So I don't know if it diluted it or it changed the pH. I don't know, but I did notice that. So there's also that option too. So we do something similar. We'll do telazole and butorphanol for cats, but we don't reconstitute it. We used to, but the DEA doesn't like that <laughs> when you're keeping the bottle. So we, we decided we would stop doing that. We did it for a long time with nalbufene. If you're familiar with that, it was great. And then they upped the price in albufine and we've gone back to butorphanol, but we'll do 0.1, usually in a 0.1 to 0.2 in a cat, depending on their size with twice the amount of butorphanol as telazole and 0.05 of ACE for every cat. But then we will add just saline and not a lot, 0.1 mLs you know, enough, the equal amount of the teal is all. And we rarely have a cat reaction and we go IM or sub Q, depending on the, the pet, the doctor, whatever. Very rarely have a sting. Thank you, Lori. Um, we had a, uh, a chat question for Jeff. It says, hi, Jeff and other alfaxalone users. What are your thoughts with the IM injection on emaciated pets, especially kitties? Where do you find muscle and is that painful with the volumes? Oh, good question. Um, well, in, in my experience, well, first of all, emaciated kitties usually don't weigh too much. So thankfully the volume that I would need to be injecting with my protocol um, could be about half a milliliter um, for a really skinny little cat. So thankfully we've got a smaller volume to start with. I'll still be using that 25 gauge needle but then I am just feeling around in the lumbar area, trying to find a spot where I can inject. And often I think I end up finding just a little bit of muscle that might be between the vertebrae. But thankfully, um, it, it tends to go very smoothly, actually. Um, that, uh, it, it seems to be and um, so it's, it's not even a second to inject. And it seems, yeah, it seems to work okay. Great. Are there any other, any, does anybody else want to add comment to that or question about that? I am really curious about the Alfax loan because I have not done that and I would love to give that a try. Cost-wise and availability. Yeah, Kathy, what do you have to tell me? Well, no, I was going to, I was going to, I was going to work off of yours back to Jeff, Lori. <laughs> And that is with the alfaxalone, first of all, I, I really like it. I like the fact that you don't have the dissociative effects. It just seems to be smoother, right, Jeff? It's just, it's, it's very, very smooth. And I, I have not used it much for dogs. Uh, I, it's mostly been cats and exotics. But Jeff, have you tried it without the midazolam? Because you said that alfaxalone can still have a pinch, like your combo can still have a pinch to it. I didn't notice the pinch, but I don't use midazolam and midazolam's got that low pH. So thoughts on that? No, I, I, have, I, I use it in small dogs all the time. Um, it is absolutely my choice. Just as soon as that injection is done, I don't know, it's just so peaceful. <laughs> um, and not, not that I find my other combination is not, but I find that this is just a little bit, a little bit faster, a little bit smoother. So I really like that. I have not tried it without the midazolam because it's been working so well, but it is something that I could try and see if maybe there's just a little bit less of a reaction without I would. midazolam. I would, I would switch out your midazolam. Just try it. I know that can be okay. kind of scary, but I would switch out midazolam for ACE and, and you're welcome to try my protocol. 
but yes. it would be alfaxlon, butorphanol, and ACE and see what happens. Cause I don't get the reaction. I don't get pinches from it, which is why I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I have a question um, for Julianne. Where, where do you get the shock blocker? I've not, I've not heard of this before. Where do you get one? I, yes, I have not heard of anyone using it before, and so it was kind of a well. It was just woofy. I have one too. Because oh, of me, try, yeah. Awesome, yeah. I, so I just yeah. thought I would try it and see. What do you think? It like it works, right? I, I mean, for people, it works. Like I tried it on myself, and it, it's like if you just kept tapping yourself, it's the same sort of thing. Your brain can't register more than one thing. Um, so I think it works well on people. Uh, I think the fur part makes it a little challenging, but to answer your actual question, oh. so I, I could only find it on Amazon and I, I don't love Online. ordering things from Amazon, and but and it, Ken, did what? you see Ken's chat, Ken's message in the chat? Ken, where did you get 10 for $14? Looks like some people say Amazon. I just, I, I think it was Etsy or something. I just pl plugged it in and there, were, there it was 10 for $14, unless it's a, a, a fake one, but. <laughs> I mean, as it works, I, read off. <laughs> I think the big thing too, is you have to really like jam it on there. You can't be light about it. And so I think, especially with the fur, it really, you know, if you're just lightly placing it, it's probably not going to do much. I mean, when, you know, doing it for a person, when you're finished, you have little pulls. And so like with the hair, you, you really come on <laughs> and then they'll, it'll really do its job. That's I good. I have to squish it on hard because I wouldn't have thought about that. I'm going to yeah. get some and I'm going to start using them in laboratories. So I'll be bringing them to the IHPC conference this fall. Ooh, awesome. We'll oh, you can get it with your one. name on it with Kata on them. <laughs> oh, we'll figure out something. Always looking for those little angles, Deb. <laughs> you, can, yeah, you, can, very you can get the same effect by just scratching rubbing or even patting the area what you're doing is just some you don't think oh, it's yeah i think it's a like because well, you're I firing that too it's yeah it's a, like another level yeah you're I think it's a bigger fire. surface area you have a bigger surface area that's always being stimulated versus moving around but it probably works better christy said it works better on skinny small dogs or probably like emaciated cats, you know, where they're not sick. And there's the ones that are gonna get mad at you anyway. You know um, what this means, guys? Research. There Research. you go. <laughs> <laughs> Start tallying your your uh, findings with it. We should all do that. Juliana, you should you should follow up. And anybody who's been using yeah. it, and uh, put it on the HPC Facebook base, or, uh, page. Can we do that? Okay, good. Yeah, that would be a great thing to to add on there because. It would be really nice for a lot more people to know about that. Uh, I think this has been a really valuable conversation. And even as, as experts, we learn things from others that we haven't before. And so it's such a valuable um, thing to have so many experienced people in one setting and, and the people that need the help. Um, I mean, I think it's just been really great. And hopefully you guys will join us um, the following, I think, third Thursday, um, where we do our um, just kind of information exchange. Uh, it's been a, we tried it the first time last month. It went really well. And so um, even more information can be exchanged um, in that setting as well. Good. Well, thank you all for coming. Are there any other questions or discussion topics that people have? So everybody so much presenters we appreciate you we appreciate you thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us yes thanks everyone we really appreciate it all bye. right thank you so much well thank bye. you all bye bye have a good night have a good night <laughs>